Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're watching this broadcast from. Hello, my name is Nishit Kotak. I am with Hindu Academy. And welcome to today's broadcast. We are going to be discussing all things around the subject of Hinduism. I have with me my team with Manish Pai Sitaben and Vijay Bhai Hirani here. And if you're new to this um, broadcast, then I would invite you to either subscribe to us on YouTube. We are on youtube.com forward slash Hindu Academy or watch us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Hindu Academy. Now, what I'd like you to do is the format of the meeting is we run for about one hour. We will start with a topic that we have got uh, an initial focus topic. Today's topic being the bias of the media against Hinduism. And then we will take your question and answer on that topic and then we'll proceed to live Q&A. You can leave your questions in the comments area on Facebook or on YouTube and I will pick them up for you. So without any further ado, let's have a look at the, <clears throat> the topic of the day, which is why is the media against Hindus? Now, obviously this is very pertinent because there is quite a bit of media bias as we have recently seen uh, with the case of the BBC and the interview they did with Lady Diana. So let's watch this and then we come back and have a <clears throat> discussion around it. Enjoy this. Is it by video not playing? I think we've lost Nisib by there. Uh, his PC seemed to have crashed. So uh, I'll try and set the screen and play that video. Uh, bear with me a few minutes, please. A couple of minutes. Manish, did you take the volume stuff? I can't hear any volume on that. I think I'll have to, yeah. Uh, there's some yes, there's two ticks you're going to set, uh, pick up, yeah? Uh, when you say share there's a Zoom. In the Zoom session is the two ticks you're going to do when you share a uh, video. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you do sharing, there's a tick you're going to tick at the bottom, yeah? Or share sound and optimize for video clip before you share at the bottom is a button. No, I'm struggling. <laughs> so when you press share, uh, before you share your screen at the bottom, there's two buttons. It's called okay. share sound. Okay. Optimize for video clip. You'll see those two coming up in the Zoom. Yeah. When you, before you mm -hmm. just share the share screen. Then you press a share button. Yeah. I'm not getting those options. 
Do you want to do that? Uh... Okay, got it. It's working now. When it comes to things like reporting caste issues, animal sacrifices, communal violence, the word Hindu appears in big and big bold fonts. But when it comes to reporting the positive aspects like yoga and meditation, they replace the word Hindu with such a, words such as Eastern or Indic, etc. So, you know, uh, why is it that the Western inf world is influenced so negatively or, See, or portrays us so negatively? Okay, I'll give you the real reason. I think this is the real reason, by the way. You see, the Western thinkers know very well that the material that lies at the heart of this tradition that we belong to, this Hinduism, is so dynamic, so mind-blowing, it will steal the hearts and minds of the whole world in no time. That is why they were trying to suppress it right from day one. When they were colonized India and they discovered this spiritual dimension to India, they tried to break the backbone of India by sending people like Max Muller to do research on the Vedic scripture to see if there are some weaknesses so they can break the back backbone. If they can break bone of spirituality in India, India is gone. So this was the attempt. So it's not new. The reason is this. They are frightened with what we possess. They are frightened. It will overwhelm everything. It will overwhelm all the Abrahamic traditions. All three of them will boom disappear because it is such dynamism, such openness, such vast ideas at the heart of it. It will steal the hearts and minds of any thinking youngster from any religion as well as no religion. We possess that power and they are aware of it. So that's they are always out to demolish us, you know, kind of reduce our credibility all the time. Nothing new. United States, UK, they're always kind of always showing the worst. You see, every religion has got some quirky bits. You know, we all have warts. So rather than focus on the beauty of the whole face, they will you know, kind of take the microscope and go near the world and say, this is Hinduism. That's what they've been doing. So they'll show naked fucky jumping in the river Ganga. Ah, see, this is when they're smoking ganja. This is Hinduism. Oh, worshipping snakes. Oh, they are doing this. And they will focus on oh, animal sacrifice. Majority. If you want to see animal sacrifice, go to any butcher in Bradford. The million, the thousand butchers in, in, in Bradford sacrificing animals in the name of religion every day. You don't need to go to visit some temple in India. So we don't need. But they will focus on one Kali temple. They, they butcher a goat. Oh, this is Hinduism. Once, you know, one temple doing this or something, they will try and exaggerate that and show Hinduism a very poor light. It's a very unfortunate legacy of a British Raj. And do you know what is the worst thing? In a way they won. They wanted to break the backbone of um, this tradition and by imposing their own tradition on us and making us kind of look English. They have in a way imposed themselves by in a way demolishing our own dignity, our own love of our own tradition. If you talk to a major, at the moment if you talk to India, Hindus in India or youngsters in the UK, the moment you wish about Hinduism, they'll just walk away. They'll say, oh, no, outdated or old nonsense. They have no, their love for their tradition has been demolished completely. So it's not the Westerner. We have done it ourselves quite well. So we, they have managed, succeeded in, in a way for us to devalue our own tradition. And this is visible in, when I, when I look at some of the wonderful personalities in the West, great his, Hindu you know, masters here in the West, uh, focusing on com commerce, whatever, they're doing masterly thing, but the moment you bring in the word religion, they run away. Because they've lost their faith, they don't believe in it, they don't think this has got any value. So this is what is happening. Look, people like us, and maybe people like you, should help this process of reviving and refreshing the deeper vision of our tradition, not to score point, but to bring it back, make it come alive, revive and refresh it, make it come, make it more vitalized. So our little work that we do in a humble way, using WhatsApp, using YouTube, we are pushing in this positive message of Hinduism, left, right and center. It is entering the system big time that we know. There we go. We have uh, our focus video of today, which was on the media bias on Hinduism. So I have my panel with me. We've got Manish Pai, Vijay Pai, and we've got Sita Ben. So Manish Pai, over to you to head the next part of this meeting. Thank you, Nisid Bai. Um, uh, welcome viewers to our uh, weekly show, uh, live Q&A on Hinduism. So as we saw this week, uh, big news came out that BBC, um, uh, was found to be have uh, you know violated 
the code of conduct and the way they conducted Diana interview, which led to many things happening in that front. And uh, the way we, our experience, Ajay Bai's experience of uh, dealing with BBC has been very poor, uh, you know, the way BBC has uh, given Hindu, uh, source Hinduism and India has been very poor. Sita Bin, could you add some light on this, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my dad was literally like banging his head on the door trying to sort of present Hinduism in the correct way in terms of the deeper, wonderful ideas that Hinduism possesses, um, which should be given so much exposure um, to the, you know, to the world, essentially, because the, these ideas of non-theistic Hinduism are very, very relevant to the world today. People are moving away from the idea of God with form and they love these ideas that you can be spiritual through art or music or whatever. And you can, you know, have the basis of morality through spiritual humanism. Everyone is divine and that's why we should do good to humanity. Um, these are wonderful ideas at the heart of Hinduism, which when you ask even a Hindu, they're like, oh, really? Is that what we're all about? So it's very, very important to get these ideas across. But instead of the you know, media channels sort of promoting these ideas, they're much more interested on focusing on the same old issues, the same old problems around caste. They keep focusing on caste so much and you just get tired of answering questions on caste. All these negative, they try and say, oh, you're worshipping cows. What kind of people are you? You're uncivilized people. They try and sort of put us down instead of raising us up and raising up the whole of humanity by promoting these wonderful gems at the heart of Hindu philosophy. Um, it's a real shame and we just have to keep plugging on and continuing dad's work and do the best that we can and hope that we can get there someday. Um, Vijay Bhai, your thoughts? Yeah, I think Sita, you called it quite well. I mean, it's really sad. I think partly the reason is, as, as Jay Bhai mentioned in the video, you see, the idea of the Hindus, they're not conformalist to a particular ideology or stuck in one particular way. And you can imagine if you're a clergy who control people, vast amount of people with a book, all of a sudden you come with a faith which, is, which gives you the individual freedom to choose the path you want. And look at these profound ideas. You can imagine how threatening that will be. And it seems like BBC, as Sita mentioned, that they just don't want to bring the ideas of idea of spiritual humanism, pluralism. They're really, really scared. And you know, it's the other funny thing is that, as Deva mentioned, even as Hindus, they kind of have lost the plot because we are not trying to fight for this. Uh, we sometimes also kind of given up. I'll give you an example. In BBC, a while back, there were some programs on temples. The way they're portraying some of the image, or oh, look at this very beautiful erotic image. And some of the word, I kind of picked it up because I, was, I don't have a positive view of BBC anyway. But a lot of people said, oh, very good program. But if you look at it very carefully, the way they present the idea is almost to show the negative aspects. I mean, I'm still waiting for the day when BBC today presents a kind of a series of lectures on the great philosophies of Hinduism, of Ramanuja, or, you know, of Sankhya Darshan. I haven't seen that, and I doubt I'll ever see that. But the whole idea is to protect Hinduism in negative light. And the other thing is that quite a few times I've seen Jay Bhai on debates, and as Sita mentioned, they talk about the caste system and the Manusmriti. Now, look, the fact is most Hindus don't even have a copy of the Manusmriti in their homes. For all I know, some of the Christian clergy have, a, have more copies of this than we will ever do. But because the fact that Hinduism is a very broad and a vast religion, it gives people freedom to write anything they want. You can pick a book from hundreds of thousands of Hindus and pick one book and start using that to kind of negate Hinduism. That's how Hinduism works. That's how BBC has been playing this game for a long time. And I think as Jay Bai said, we just have to rise up and fight this. And look, Hinduism is not only about this little odd something happening in the very far in some remote areas. Hinduism alive in us, yes, and it's a living thing, and it's a very divine thing. I think that's something that we have to push a really hard for a message. As Jay Bai said, ultimately, we have to fight. We can't just sulk and say, oh, they're doing this to us. No, I think we'll have to rise and just roll over there and fight back as, as Jay Bai used to do. And that's all I can say on that, uh, Manish Bai. Yeah. Thank you, Vijay Bai uh, and Sita Ben. So as we saw, you know, time and again, BBC has uh, treated uh, Hinduism and uh, even in showing India in very poor light. Yeah. We've had um, Jay Bai uh, helping them with a documentary on Sister Nivedita. And what came out was Sisters of Kali and trying to portray her as a terrorist. Uh, second, uh, there was a documentary done in uh, 2019 
uh, Parley Patel's um, uh, about uh, caste system in Hindu uh, in United Kingdom. And uh, they edited out completely uh, so Jay Bai's input to it, where he very strongly uh, talked about against caste system. And that was completely, uh, you know, edited out. And we see such, um, you know, uh, what you call, uh, <clears throat> I'm not getting the word. So such a bad re representation of Hinduism from uh, BBC. And they are, they've got the viewership. They, there are millions of people viewing. And for us, we have a few hundred thousand people uh, watching us. And how do we fight this sort of organization? Sita Bin? Ah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a battle that we have to sort of keep pursuing. And I think, in our own small way, what we're doing through social media is probably the way that we can get around it because our previous sort of generations, it was just the mainstream media that people had to rely on for their source of information. But now we also have a very powerful source through social media. And although, you know, there is all sorts of negative things about social media, we can use it for a greater good in, in this sense. So, you know, the strength of social media, we get as many sort of people following, liking us, sharing our videos. This is the way that we can hopefully try and penetrate and get through to the wider population, the wider community, and just make people aware of what Hinduism is actually about rather than what the media wants it to be about. So, in, in a way, um, social media can be seen as a bit of a boon for us because we can present it the way we want to without worrying about it being edited out and mis misshown, essentially. Um, Vijay Bhai? Yeah, I think that, I think, as Sita will mention, we should try and use all uh, avenues that we have at our disposal, especially the social media, we are very lucky. So we should try and the best we can, I'll urge viewers as well to kind of spread Jaiba's message. One thing to mention about the video that uh, Manish Bhai talked about in BBC about um, the caste system. It is so bizarre because they managed to get one example of, I think, uh, somebody or daughter of somebody following a father's profession as a carpenter. And that was shown. And believe me, this day I've seen very few children of carpenters becoming carpenters. And as you know, Indians are doing really well at, in, in education in, in the UK. So by and large, all, I mean, children, I'm from a farming community and I'm, in, I'm a software engineer and my children are learning mathematics. So to show that one character and say, oh, cast is alive. I mean, how can BBC even get away with it? I just don't understand. It. And they try so hard to show that. And the other thing they mentioned was that, oh, look, somebody from this clan is marrying that clan. And look, if you grow up in the same clan together, of course, you're going to have similar traits, right? That's got nothing to do with caste discrimination. So, I mean, the BBC is trying all kinds of angles and the way I see, they kind of miss the floor totally. But there you go. That's how they're desperate to do this. For how long they'll do it, I don't know. All I can say that, as Jay Bai said, I think we are reviving now. Hinduism is coming at the profound ideas of Hinduism. We are lucky. We don't actually have a go at other religions saying they're bad. We're saying, look, we all work together and we should all, there are many pathways to God. And that is something that I think Abrahamic friends find, faiths find really hard to accept. But I think we just have to plow on and fight and use the tools that we have in the best way we can. Thank you for that, uh, Vijay Bhai. So as you mentioned, you know, there is there seems to be a kind of lobby, a Western lobby who's working really hard. And what is happening in India, especially, you know, after independence, we should have gone back and said, what's good in our system? Let's focus on that. And what we've seen is Hinduism put in back burner and uh, Bollywood trying to portray uh, Hinduism in poor light and not showing the, you know, uh, the good points, the positive points about Hinduism, it's completely ignored, uh, even in India. And uh, this say uh, now, uh, thankfully with the social media, we are able to present to certain viewers, some viewers, this, these ideas, but overall, there seems to be a strong lobby working against Hindus. Uh, what do you have to say about that, uh, Vijay Bhai? Uh, I think Manish may already say it's very true. I, I'll give you an example. At independence, for some reason, the Indian constitution say that the temples have to be controlled by the government as an example, right? Now that money is, is, is kind of pillage, is, is destroyed. And now there's so many temples in all of India, like if you look at Tamil Nadu, <coughs> over 2000 temples are now derelict, right? No amount of money has been used. All the money for the big temples we have, like Tirupati, you know, Guru Vairampan temple, or the Minakshi, which make a lot of money. They all be 
taken away by all the you know politicians and used for their own benefit. And as a matter of fact, I suspect it's a very strong lobby even in the UK, uh, which are using that kind of angle and somehow trying to get Hindu, trying to encourage the population to go away from Hinduism somehow or the other. And they're trying all kinds of tricks and trade. I mean, look, they will keep on doing that because they believe. And I mean, I've been told personally by the you know clergy that India is by far the hardest nut to crack because we have a civilization, we have a language, we have scriptures, and it's not easy to break. So they're working immensely hard. I mean, I grew up in Africa, and to be honest, Africa was so easy, easy to get to Christianity. There was no scriptures, just you know, traditional religion. But Indian civilization is far, far stronger. So they will not give up that easily. It's just that we have to really, really put our sleeves on and, and fight this. And I mean, at all angles, as I said, I mean, you can't even teach Hinduism in India. So if you ask most people, I mean, who is Shankara, Ramana, you'd be surprised. We know far more than many people in India because a deliberate attempt has been made not to teach this in schools, yeah? I mean, how can you do to a country your own your own civilization and heritage? You told you can't be taught about it in your own schools. That's just, it just beats me, but there we are. But as Sita said, let's use the social media. And I mean, it's going forward now. Let's use it in a much more powerful way and, and say this is what kind of gems we have in Hinduism, yeah? Uh, Sita, I mean, a very sad um, situation. I, yeah, it is, it is, but I think, the beauty of, of these wonderful ideas we have, we just have to sort of, you know, take off all the dross away from it, let it shine for the beauty that it is and let people sort of realise what sort of wonderful gems that we have. Let, let it come that way rather than us sort of, you know, going out and converting and all of that. We, we just shine brightly and we sort of expose it let people see it and let people feel inspired and uplifted. And we do this in the most sort of gentle way that we can, um, you know, without sort of going out there and proselytizing or all of that. We just let it shine and people will come. Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, there, Sita Ben, um, yes, let's keep shining our light and hopefully people will realize one day that uh, what gems there are in Hinduism. And not just Hinduism, we talk about Buddhism, we talk about Jainism, completely ignored. Now, Buddhism is very popular in West, and we hardly see any programs about Buddha or his teachings. Um, it's again, you know, such a pity that uh, such wonderful material is not presented. And we see you know, even you know, documentaries, like uh, they will keep on focusing on um, Egyptian uh, pyramids and stuff, but we hardly see any good program on the Indian arts, culture, sculptures, the temples, beautiful temples, hardly see anything. So how do we, bring this positive light, you know, uh, in the mainstream media, Vijay Bhai? Okay, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the Egyptian mummies. You see, they're not a threat anymore. They are history, right? <laughs> so they will show you in the greatest of detail, they'll show hours and hours of mummies, you know, how they discovered, you know, how they kind of decipher, they kind of dissect them, they show all that. They're not a threat, but we are, the Indic face are a threat. So. I think you'll have to wait a long time before anything positive on our face. But you're right. I mean, I have seen programs on, you know, temples of Khajuraho, the erotic temples, or look at how erotic that is, you know, all this stuff. But when it comes to profound ideas of Hinduism, the beautiful stuff, you know, about the inner side of Hinduism, inner, inner self, yes, that is missing and they will not show it, no matter how hard you try, yeah? Because I, as, as Jay Bai said, I'm very, very sure uh, we are a threat to the conformalist religions. The idea of the individualist Hinduism where it gives you the freedom to pursue your own, you know, a divine path, that is a very big threat. I mean, let's face it, all groups derive power by controlling, you know, the flock, yes, as I call it. And Hindus tend not, they have small groups, no doubt, of, you know, followers of different sectarian movements, but by and large, they don't follow the flock. So we are very threatening, and the only way to is, is to try and hide the positive parts and really push the negative parts. And they keep on doing that. But I think you just laugh it off and say that, but you're right, it's not only Hinduism, Buddhism as well. I think Buddhism at the moment perhaps is not seen a threat because there's about 300 million followers. Hindus are like, you know, over a billion. So they are a bigger challenge for them. But I think Buddhism time will come because I suspect even Buddhism as it gets more and more stronger in the West, they got some really beautiful ideas. I suspect that they will start facing a problem as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, Sita Ben, can you add on that? Yeah, I mean, there's so much more I can really add apart from, you know, we just let our light shine in the best way that we can. And I think what we have is really relevant, so relevant to the world at the moment, this idea of interfaith dialogue, religious pluralism, non-theistic ways of making spiritual progress. All of these are so incredibly relevant to the world today. And these ideas of sitting in temples and churches is just becoming less and less popular by the day. So it's very, very important that these ideas get out there. We make use of the tools that we have, like social media, and let people um, know about this wonderful beauty. Just let it shine, as I said before. <laughs> Wonderful uh, uh, answer there, Sita Ben and Vijay Bhai. So as we say, there is a gems out there and uh, we can try to continue to present it. And we got a nice feedback from Ellie Sebastian who's saying social media from the Hindu Academy has been so powerful in spreading a positive representation of Hinduism. I discovered the channel two years ago by chance knowing nothing of Hinduism. Uh, yes. Thank you, Ali Sebastian for your wonderful uh, message. Uh, that give us encouragement to continue with our good work. Um, we've had a suggestion by Anand Sai saying, sir, can you please re-upload video on Hinduism beyond theism? Sure, we will do, Anand Sai, we will work on that and we will surely re-upload it, no problem. Uh, Prasant Tripathi has asked the question about Buddhism. He's saying, what, does, what relation does Buddha have with Hinduism? I've heard Buddha is ninth avatar of Vishnu, but many Buddhists reject this. What are your thoughts? Uh, there is another question regarding this Buddha as well. Philu is saying, do we believe Buddha is part of Hinduism? Uh, by the way, uh, well, he believes it, he is. Uh, so what? how do we treat Buddha, Sita Bin? Uh, so this is the thing. So Buddha sort of um, was born at a time in India where there was a real need for a sort of a revival and a different way of thinking. And um, mm -hmm. what he presented is very different to the sort of old school traditional Hinduism, this idea of gods and praying to God and trying to find the resolution to the human condition. Actually, Buddha turned it around and says, you don't need to rely on an external God, just find a resolution to suffering, look, look inwards rather than, um, you know, seeing all the problems outside, focus inwards and you can find a resolution to human suffering, which is a really beautiful idea. It's very relevant to the world today especially with all the mental health issues that people are going through especially with the pandemic as well um, so it's a wonderful idea and Hinduism is very sort of you know opened its arms and welcomed Buddha into um, its sort of whole range of avatars and um, you know we see it as being you know, in a way incorporated as an, an element of within Hindu philosophy, Hindu teachings, whereas Buddhists themselves like to see themselves as being separate to Hinduism, which is totally fine because we're completely pluralistic in the way we think. And Buddhists say we, our approach is very different. We, we see things in a different way, even they have sort of technical differences between reincarnation, rebirth, this uh, concept of God is very different. So Yes, everyone is welcome uh, to think of, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism in whichever way they like. And as long as everyone makes spiritual progress, then we're all winners, essentially. Um, Vijay Pai? I think Siva Sita Ikoi really beautifully. I think you're right. The Buddha came at a time when India needed a revival. And so in many ways, Hindus see him as one of their own because he brought his revival on the idea of how to tackle all these issues and how to resolve the human condition. So he came with a new message where there was extensive sacrifices, too much rituals, rituals taking place, external rituals. And Buddha said, oh, look, we need to stop this and, and look at a different <clears throat> angle and how to help the suffering. Because he has seen it firsthand. And I think in that sense, Hindus kind of revere him as the avatar because he actually, you know, that's what Gita says anyway. You know, I come again, again, revive Dharma. So Buddha is the classic example who really fits that role. So in that sense, we see him. But of course, don't forget that Buddhism spread down many other parts of Asia. I mean, it moved down to Sri Lanka first. The Theravada tradition is for Sri Lanka, Burma, and they developed into their own kind of philosophies. And I mean, the Pali Canon is absolutely stunning. This huge collection of his works. And then it spread to China, you know, the other, what do you call, they call them the Zen uh, Buddhism, Mahayan vehicles, and then the Vajrayan for the Tibetan. So it spread out so far out. And don't forget that Buddhists are really prolific writers. I think I believe that... Um, 
in South Korea, they're actually collecting all the Buddhist documents which have been saved so far. And by, by now, they've got about 3 million documents on Buddhist teachings. So they've kind of evolved in their own way because it's spread far out in, into Asia. So Buddhism is also really special in that sense. I mean, they, I mean, if you remember, the, there's a very, very sad situation which is about Naranda University, the great Buddhist university in uh, Bihar. And he said that when I think Bhakti Akhilji, the great Islamic conqueror, destroyed it, it took him six months to burn all the Buddhist documents, yeah? Because I think he didn't find a, a copy of the Quran or something like that. But it, nevertheless, Buddhism has developed far, far greatly. And in a way, we should be happy that it is still a part and part and parcel of the Indic idea of how to resolve the human condition. So I know the differences, but hey, we still live with each other and respect both, yeah? Wonderful uh, answer there, Seta Ben Vijaybhai. So as we see, you know, in um, Indic traditions, if we con come to concept of Dharma, there is no clear boundary between say Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism even. So we don't have one book and I say, this is what defines Hinduism. There's another book that is defining um, uh, Buddhism or Jainism. So that is a problem uh, that uh, we are interrelated. And uh, Asa Satpati's question uh, is relevant in that sense. It says, say, say, if someone from the panel, uh, if any Westerners, anyone asks them, what is Hinduism? How do we answer this? Vijay Bhai? Yeah, okay. It's, I mean, they, it looks tricky on the onset because you think, oh, Hinduism is, how do you describe it? But look, Hinduism can describe, as uh, Jaiba mentioned, is to try and resolve the human condition and see your true nature, what your true nature is. And that's the kind of the goal of Hinduism. While it's true that some of the, like the word dharma is very vast and broad in its understanding, it can be broken down to simpler, of course it's a very big word, but you can pick it on simpler parts, like doing your duty, righteous living, the idea of innermost nature of us is all divine. So these are all profound ideas, which are very, very Indic ideas. But I would go further and say that actually dharma applies to the entire humanity, not just Hindus. It doesn't matter how the West sees it. The idea of dharma is not linked to one religion or a group of religions from India. No doubt, we call Indian religions as dharmic religions, dharmic as dharmas, not as a kind of religion in that sense. The religion implies a theos. So in that sense, it's different, no doubt. But having said that, Hinduism, the best to define Hinduism, say, look, is this the word Sanatan dharma? Is to find that goal to find our true nation, who we truly are. And that's the discovery, the journey of discovery is one way of looking at Hinduism. Uh, Sita Ben, can you give a more profile? Yeah, no. precise answer to that? Yeah, no, no, you've answered it amazingly. So um, obviously like uh, Therma is essentially trying to find the, the unity behind all the diversity. And you can in a way say that it's more like a science than a religion. It's like a sci it's a scientific process in a way, trying to find the correlations between nature and trying to find the unity behind things that appear to be very diverse. Um, another thing I can add about Hinduism is we very much believe in the cyclical nature of time. So ideas like reincarnation are very sort of integral to Hindu, Hindu thinking, Hindu beliefs. Um, the nature of creation, creation, preservation, destruction is also a very Hindu idea. Um, but obviously the main sort of, you know, two things which are very sort of hidden away and tucked away which we are trying to get out there are these wonderful ideas of spiritual humanism the idea that everyone is essentially divine and it gives a real basis for morality and secondly this idea of religious pluralism not only within hinduism you can make a variety of different um, approaches for making spiritual progress but uh, different religions and even any disciplined human endeavor any art music dance whatever science they all ultimately lead to the same goal and these are the gems of Hinduism which people are not aware of people know about all oh, reincarnation and all of that but this is really the heart of it and so relevant to the world today wonderful answer Asita Ben so as we see uh, there is many ideas in Hinduism which is uh, great and uh, there are many words like dharma which does not have comparable word in English uh, and Raju Malhotra has uh, written, uh, I think, done a video on Sanskrit non-translatables -translat and trying to, you know, portray these uh, Sanskrit words into, uh, or uh, how do we, you know, even do that? 
So the Paul Elliott says, why not instead of complaining, go through Rajiv Malhotra Sanskrit non-translatables and so that Sanskrit has a superior understanding of psychological states than English. So it's, it's about how do we present these ideas uh, in English when it's not translatable. There are no comparable words. Vijay Bhai? Okay, it's true. I mean, it's diff difficult because first of all, we have to understand one thing that the entire Indic tradition has got a different root in that sense, yeah? And of course, their thoughts, the profound ideas, the great experience of rishis are very, very different. So the idea of dharma is a very unique idea, Indic idea in that sense. And to be frank, a lot of Hindus in the West of what don't even understand, don't even go down. And you can't translate it. I mean, there's, I mean, if you think that he, English is a, is a superior language, we, we can understand everything. No, it does not. It doesn't matter what region you take, what language you take. You can take a Sami language, where they have, I think, uh, dozens of words for reindeer. So, of course, depending on the state of reindeer, they'll have a different word, depending on what they mean, the snow, whatever. And we won't have that because that's their tradition. So there is no way you will ever do that. You have to accept that. The only way to understand dharma properly, ultimately, of course, you understand its roots. And I guess Sanskrit is a major part in that. Now, to go down that route and try to explain to every Hindu on that idea, to go and now learn from the very root Hindu is going to be a big challenge. I think we have to start from where we are and work for what they know and then build on that. But yeah, it's a valid point that some things in Sanskrit are not translatable because they never will be, let's face it. They're not from an Indi uh, kind of a Western Caucasian root. They're actually an Indic root word, an Indic, profoundly Indic idea. So it requires, it's, it's not only just objectiveness, it's also subjectiveness, which plays a big role in this kind of language, yeah? So it's difficult to just pull it down in words. Uh, it's difficult to answer this question, actually. Uh, Sita, man, can you elaborate on that? Um, actually, it reminds me of something that I learned in anthropology from university, is that language develops on, you know, the, the, the different cultures. The things that are very prominent in that particular culture, there are a huge, elaborate range of vocabulary for those particular words. So say, for example, there's an Inuit, they've got hundreds of different words for snow and ice, and we've only got snow and ice and that's it. <laughs> so this is the thing, I think within Indian languages, because we were so lucky, we had philosophy at our heart. That was the thing that we focused on. It wasn't snow like the Inuit, it was this idea of Atman and Brahman and Dharma and all of these wonderful things. So we've got wonderful intricate vocabulary, which is demonstrated through the language of Sanskrit. We've got such subtle vocabulary that when you kind of try and translate it into Western vocabulary, which is sort of focused more on the external things, like we've got hundreds of words for technology and gadgets in English, which we don't have in Indian languages. We use phone in Indian languages as well. So this is the thing. We so Sanskrit has got to this huge elaborate vocabulary on all of these subtle ideas and when you try and put it into English it doesn't quite translate but I think the closest that we can get to this kind of translation are the teachings of Swami Vivekan and he was able to in very elaborate um, English explain the subtle depths of Hindu philosophy so anyone out there who is looking for the closest sort of thing to Hindu philosophy um, in modern day language, please look to the teachings of Swami Vivekananda and it will blow your mind. <laughs> That's a wonderful answer there, Sita Ben, really good. Uh, someone just commented that uh, they love your smile, yeah, the way you smile. <laughs> <Great. laughs> um, Jan Tabi is asking, sir, how do I make my son understand about Hinduism? Currently, they are just casual about it. How, uh, Sita Ben, how do and just uh, make a son understand about Hinduism? Um, I mean, I think because the world is changing a lot. So, you know, you have to try and sort of move away from some of the traditional things. It's nice to obviously have that link with traditional aspects of Hinduism, um, but then try and sort of tell them the universal message behind it. And straight away, it'll be so much more appealing to, to their minds because, you know, they're growing up in such a, <clears throat> national community everyone is growing up with so many different uh people of so many different backgrounds so i think it's really important that you know we sort of emphasize the universality of these spiritual ideas um yes it's very nice to talk about all the forms of god Hanuman, ganesh and it's very important to have that link but this is really what you want to sort of 
focus on these wonderful spiritual ideas of Atman, Brahman, Dharma, all of that. And if you can sort of get them latched onto those ideas, it's going to support them for the rest of their lives. And they're going to be better human beings as a result, I think. Um, Vijay Bhai? I think Sita, you have quite, quite nice. All I can add is depending on the age group, just keep in mind the age group. I mean, the young, uh, Sita has focused on the story parts, you know, morality. As you grow older, bring up new ideas. And then when they're kind of in the teens or, or kind of when they grow as adults, bring up the profound ideas of Indian philosophy and the universality of our message. I think that's all I can add on that yeah, question. Amazing. So we are almost at 45 minutes into the broadcast. We are going to extend it by another five minutes or so because we had some technical issues at the start and we have so many questions to cover yet. So I'm going to be very quick. What else can you do? I can tell you one more thing you can do is to point your sons to some of our resources. So let me just share some of the resources that we have available for anybody who wants to get started with Hinduism. So visit our website, hindu-academy.com. And if you want to submit your question by video, just scan this code and you'll be able to do so. We'll answer your question. We'll bring your video on live on air. And on this website, you've got a number of resources, first of which is our ebook, which talks about Hinduism. This is the primary um, text that was used for uh, Hinduism GCSE students. And then we also have our free e-learning course that you can access from here. If you have any technical troubles, you have my contact details over here. Now, you can see that there are almost 7,000 students. My goal is to get at least 10,000 students enrolled. So please, if you're watching this and you're interested in Hinduism, do enroll, it's free of charge, and you will then be given uh, a whole set of uh, initial videos that will take you through a great understanding on the basics of Hinduism. And uh, so we have about 15 minutes to go, uh, 15, 20 minutes. So Manish, Pai, back to you again. Thanks, Anisil Bai, for that uh, answer. Uh, we've got a feedback from Safe Planet saying, Namaste, Chetim. I was trying to find all the Q&A sessions that Jaisar and Nisid Bai used to do. Is it possible for you to create a playlist uh, of them so it's easily found on the channel? I think there is a playlist there and you may be able to find, but not all of them. We'll have to work on that and we do have limited resources, so it may take some time before we get that done. But uh, we are trying to bring on all the materials that uh, Jay Bai has presented. So we continue to make small videos. Uh, they are uh, coming daily. We, are, we continue to find gems from them and put it, push it back out there on uh, YouTube. So that work is ongoing. And uh, if someone can help, uh, please uh, do uh, get in touch uh, by email or uh, some of the uh, on WhatsApp or uh, yes, uh, by, by email, it'd be great. <clears throat> okay, Eddie is asking why Hinduism is mocked mock the most. And even if we are, are ready to explain our people mock us, but usually not Abrahamic faiths, they are respected by default. Uh, see, uh, Vijay Bhai, why are we mocked the most? I think it's partly, I guess we have, we have to get stronger and understand our faith properly. I think the problem comes that when people are mocking Hinduism, I think Sita has mentioned a few times earlier that we ourselves don't understand our faith. We don't even know how to challenge that mocking sometimes. So what are the things? So how do we take them on? Is you go to learn and it's different. And as Nishit Nish, just mentioned, please watch those videos to strengthen. I think the other thing, sorry to say this, I think we Hindus need to wake up because I guess for a thousand years, you know, we have been conquered. India has been uh, different kind of uh, other kind of, you know, religions for a long, long time. It's about time we wake up. And I'll be in a bit harsh on that. So like it is a classic case of a, you know, the master is long gone, yes, but we still tend to be ourselves. I think we need to stand up and look, we don't have to kind of get angry and react violently. All you have to do is send a simple message. Like if you say you don't like something from BBC or some article in some, all you do is put a small line, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. I think your, your, you know, your view is very negative. Please go and learn yourself about Hinduism. If you put a small, small comment, if there are very many comments coming, they'll be taken aback. The fact that we don't challenge it is just, yeah, okay. I mean, they are, they're happy with that. Then they'll continue. But as I say, please go on our site and learn about the basic Hinduism. If you don't know, then you're ready to take them head on. 
But we have so much strong machine, we don't have to react in an aggressive manner. We can just reiterate what it is about, and that should be enough, hopefully, to turn the tide in the near term and perhaps the long term. Kita uh, Ben? Uh, yeah, I mean, that you've answered it amazingly. I don't know if there's much else I can add. It's just what we can do is just sort of armors, armor ourselves with the understanding of our religion so that we don't feel like we're on a back foot when we're talking about religion. We feel like we're on a front foot. We're like, hey, we want to talk. We want to answer your questions. Um, we can address the misconceptions that are around Hinduism. And then you, it, once you have the confidence, it gives others the confidence. They actually, gosh, you what an amazing religion. You're so lucky to be born into this tradition or be aware of all of its teachings. Um, so that's, I guess, the role of Hindu Academy. And we're trying our best to sort of get people understanding Hinduism in the most sort of structured and rational way. Wonderful answer there, Sita Ben Vijay. So uh, Philu has asked the interesting question. He said Buddha has forgiven Unguli Mal, who was a you know, highway robber and he was forgiven um, by Buddha. Should we forgive all criminals if they are able to change their mindset? Now that, you know, I, it just reminds me of, um, there was a culture, uh, Rajput culture, where they would forgive. If somebody said, oh, I come to your refuge, they would even forgive the enemy and say, okay, let, I'll let you go. And this happened with Prithviraj Chauhan Mohammed Ghori. 17 times he was defeated, he said, "I." bow down to you, I'm in your refuge, and he was let go. And we've seen what happened, it changed the history. So should all be forgiven? Do we, how do we judge if somebody's changed their mindset? Uh, Sita Ben? That's a really difficult question. Um, obviously, I mean, we should try and follow the example of the Buddha in terms of trying to forgive and, you know, try and make sure that we show compassion to every living thing because everyone is on their own individual journey. We don't know what obstacles, what suffering they've gone through to be making perhaps bad decisions. Um, so we have to try and give people the benefit of the doubt. But the other side of the coin is we should also not make sure that people don't take advantage of us. We're not seen as being too soft and people can walk all over us because yes, we show compassion to everyone, but we have to also show compassion to ourselves and make sure that we are not taken for a ride as well because we are all essentially divine beings. So it's a very difficult balance. I mean, we have to try and give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't know their history, the suffering they've gone through. So try and give people the benefit of the doubt, but at the same time, be sort of, on your guard, I guess. Um, just be careful about what people are doing and saying and make sure that you are not sort of suffering as a result. Um, Vijay Bhai? Yeah, I think, as Sita said, you have to be very clear how we judge. And I'll go with the message of the Gita as well, you know. As the last step, you have to, sometimes if you have to fight, you must end up in a fight. You try your best to negotiate. I think the story of Angulimal is a bit unique because don't forget it's the Buddha. And if you look at the story, Angulimal was totally shattered when he saw the Buddha and he was totally, totally, totally you know, profoundly impacted by the Buddha. And not only that, he actually agreed to join the sun. Unlike the case of, you know, Muhammad Gauri, who kind of said, okay, I'll, bye bye, I'm going away, I'll come back again. This was a very unique case. So I'm not sure we can compare, but yeah, as, as, I think we should take everything by case by case. The Angulimal, Angulimal case is very unique. And as I said, we're talking about the Buddha here, who's whose profound energy just would change somebody's life. Forget, you know, even he, would, he doesn't even speak a word. As, as you look at the story very carefully, all he saw was a Buddha. He tried to catch him, he couldn't. And eventually he said, well, how come my body is all frozen? And he just said, okay, I'm in front of a really amazing, you know, somebody much more powerful than me. And he just fell at his feet. It's a very unique situation, but yeah. So I think we'd have to really, as Sita said, weigh everything very carefully before we make a decision on this, yeah. Wonderful answer there, uh, uh, Vijay Bhai. We take the next question. And just looking for one. Give, uh, give me a second, please. Okay, we got a feedback from Table Music. He's saying, Lakani, sir, you're abundant and uh, you're abundant in knowledge. Please go to every country and spread Hinduism like Swami Vivekananda. Now, Lakani sir's uh, 
going through social media and uh, trying to get there everywhere. So, and we are trying our best to get him <laughs> to every home. So that is our uh, effort and hopefully we'll, we are getting there. Uh, so I'm a bit struggling with the chart system. So question so is... Uh, okay, so... Mahesh Jadav has asked, I've noticed people like Zaki and Naik influencing public at large uh, with his misinterpretation of tax and manipulating them to suit. Show, uh, so his, uh, to show his idol ideology is best over others. To ex uh, how do we expose such vendetta, Vijay Bhai? Okay, look, this is a classic thing. I mean, a lot of people do this, yeah? And I think rather than elevate them, actually demeans them because I can take the best from my religion and the worst from my religion and step on it. And that's what he's really doing. He takes a particular verses and he just memorizes verses and he says it. But by the way, something interesting about Zaiki Naik, I actually a while back, I met a, a, a proper Islamic scholar and I asked him about Zaki Naik. And what he told me is in every verse he says, he makes about 10 different mistakes in pronunciation of Arabic. So Arabic is not that good at all. It's just the way he memorizes and he thinks he's doing it correctly. The, the, unfortunately, the thing is that, look, he'll keep on doing that because that's the only way he gets prominence and the, his followers get prominence. Look, we are superior. But that's a game I think we should try and not play. Anybody can do that. I can torture any text, as J. Bai says. You know, I can twist and get blood out of any kind of text. But let's not play that game. Learn our religion thoroughly and spread the profound ideas that we have, the amazing gems we have. If he did that, then I think Zaki Naik has got nothing. He, he will kind of be defeated very easily. So we have to fight on the positive and the beauty that we have. And ultimately, hopefully, all the people who are kind of um, working towards spirituality will take our ideas and uh, kind of yeah, use them. Uh, Sita Ben? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably the best way. We don't do what he does. We don't try and step on other religions to show ourselves in a better light. That's that's his style, but it's not our style. We just sort of um, present our ideas, make them as widely known as possible so people have a strong understanding <laughs> of our religion and let it sort of prove itself. It's such a strong religion. We don't need to prove it against anybody else. So let it prove itself. Let it stand on its own ground and it will shine. Wonderful answer there, Sita Ben Vijay So we do get some um, of these Abrahamic people say, why don't you uh, debate with Jack and Ike? And how do we debate with a tax torturer, as someone who's twisting the trash and make, making that his own meaning out of it? How, how do we even talk to such person? I mean, we are not here to be demean and uh, so other religion in poor light, we are pluralists. Uh, so do we be debating with such a scholar? Uh, we see that in? No, just, I mean, that's the best way of, um, I mean, you're dignifying him by replying. Just don't dignify him with a response. Ignore him. Just carry on with our work. But the more people that ignore him and turn away from him, the less power he has. So let's turn away from people like that. Focus on the strength of our tradition. We don't go out and sling mud at anybody else. We just turn away, ignore, and focus on our strength and let Hinduism stand for what it is. I think, um, Vijay Bhai? No, I agree. I mean, when I, I've listened to some of his videos because I've been asked by some people who do so, but what he does, as I said, he doesn't think for himself. He just quotes chapter and verse. If you ask him, oh, yeah, because the book says so. If you ask him for his view, he doesn't, oh, no, no, I know this is the way because that's what the book says. I mean, do you want to debate somebody who actually doesn't even have the kind of, uh, doesn't even respect his own intelligence as divine, he's seeing as something. I mean, there's no point, I, I think. I know some people have done this, some scholars, and I remember some really clever scholars went debate with him, and actually some of the videos are cut off. So it's not true that people haven't debated him, and <laughs> the thing is, then they play a different game. They start doing cut and paste of videos, yeah? So it's not as obvious as it seems. So there's no point, I think. They said, focus on spreading a message on Facebook and debate on people who are like-minded. You can challenge Hinduism. There's nothing wrong with criticizing Hinduism. But in a constructive way, then try and understand well, because Hinduism is a living religion. We can accept some constructive criticism. That's okay. But not play with games where somebody wants to torture one text and another text a different and then playing with text. That's not our game. No. Wonderful answer there, Sita Ben Vijay. Uh, we take a next question from 
Jishnu Raj P saying uh, it's his first session. Welcome to our session, uh, Jishnu Raj. So he's, asking, he's saying, somebody explain me what's Hinduism all about, what it stands for, what's the importance of Hinduism on this modern era? Uh, okay, I think Hinduism has an immense role to play, a very, I'll tell you why. I mean, look at the struggles going on in Israel. The thing is that it's only Hinduism, I would say, perhaps the Indic faith maybe as well, who actually agree with the universality, universality of the message of humanity. We don't distinguish, we don't say, look, if I say I'm a Christian, for it means somebody else is not. And the funny thing is that if you ever ask them, because I've been to many interfaiths, they don't believe in respecting other religions, they believe in tolerating other religions. That means, look, I don't like you, but I'll let you live. That's what we're really saying. They will never accept, I've struggled, believe me, I've been with Jaiba, I've struggled to say, look, why don't you accept other religions? Ah, no, 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 because they are wrong, we are right. And this is from the Crusades, the Congress on name of religion has, has done so much of this and you don't see that in India. And the thing is, it is still happening and I don't think it will stop. I know they like to say, no, 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 we are civilized, we don't use fire music. But they do, it's already been happening. You see that happening at a subtle level, you see it in many countries. So Hinduism's message is, is very universal. The idea is, Jay Bias talked time and again about the spiritual humanism or spiritual dem democracy, the idea of pluralism, the idea of divinity, idea of the principle, you know, ultimate principle, which connects all of us. And Sita just mentioned just a couple of minutes back, the idea of finding a unity in diversity. These are some of the most powerful areas of Hinduism. Look, if we don't spread the ideas of Hinduism, <clears throat> then actually we are doing a disservice to ourselves and to the profound message that we have. Um, Sita Ben? I think that's completely right. You've answered it amazingly. So this idea of seeing everyone and every living thing as divine, this idea that you can be spiritual in a variety of different ways with or without reference to a god, all of these ideas are Hinduism and people are not aware of it. So um, as we've said many times throughout this um, session, we're just out there to shine the light, to let people see it. We're not here to proselytize, we're not here to sling mud on anybody, just let the light of Hinduism shine and it will stand strong and it will shine as a beacon for so many people in the current world. Amazing. So we are at three o'clock, top of the hour. We have another five, six minutes. We're going to extend the session by. We want to ask the last few questions. Um, let's see if we can do some sort of maybe rapid fire. So we got a question from Addict saying, why is Hinduism mocked the most? Said even if when we're ready to explain about it, even our own people sometimes mock us about it, but they don't have that same attitude with the Abrahamic faiths. Those are seem to be respected by default. So any way we can change the perception of how Hinduism is versus the Abrahamic faith? That's the question. Okay, what I can say is that I think, as I said, we Hindus have this idea of, I think we are still on the back foot, get on the front foot, learn about your faith, and all I can say is fight back and show them. I mean, of course, they, will, they may not listen to you, but go out and just say it anyway, because I think we, it's, it's our, we can't blame them for that, because they've been taught that, and I think we have to come out of a mentality, passive mentality, which have been kind of subjugated for a thousand years, come out and fight. And, and one thing I've noticed, by the way, I'll just mention it now, is that a lot of Hindus still tend to show more respects to wife. Even in weddings, you go to whatever way you go, and they also say this to the fellow Indians, that mindset needs to seriously change, yes. Yeah, that's what I can say on that. Yeah. Fabulous. So, Asha... Satapati has been uh, making some observations. She says, after I found Hindu Academy, my spiritual journey transformed in a better way. And moreover, I understood my religion more deeply. Her question is, I was always uh, wondering about a satsang that makes sense for me in a current modern way. Now, before you answer the question, my, my thing is this. It is not necessary that you have to be a Hindu just because you're having a satsang. You can be a Hindu, not have any satsang at all. So if it doesn't fit in with you, then it doesn't fit in with you, but it doesn't make you any less of a Hindu. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to my fellow colleagues to give an answer on that one. 
Sit down, then. go have a look. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was already answered it, really. <laughs> um, you definitely don't need to be going to satsangs if, if that's not the, the way for you. My dad wasn't keen on satsangs, and Hinduism is, you know, as I've said before, Hinduism was his heart, and he loved Hindu philosophy, and he wasn't any less of a Hindu for not going to satsangs. Yeah, yeah, um, so this is the, the beauty of Hinduism. It's pluralistic by nature. Fabulous. So we are at five minutes past three. I think it's time to wrap up now. I am going to end with a quote from Swami Vivekanand, as I do every week. And this week's quote is this one. Stand as a rock. You are indestructible. You are the self-atman, the God of the universe. And once again, it gives us a reminder to believe in ourselves, stand firm. And, you know, like we spoke about uh, the Hindus not standing up for themselves. This is the time to stand up for yourself, do what's right, and make sure your voice is heard for everybody out there uh, loud and clear. So I'd like to bring my team back on. Thank you so very much, Vijay Bhai, Manish Bhai, Sita Ben, for ably answering the questions. You have um, really given people a lot of answers. The feedback has been phenomenal, and I'd just like to acknowledge and say thank you to all the people who joined us today, taking the time out of their busy days to be with us for this one hour and sharing their comments, their thoughts, their feedback with us. It does help us and encourage us when we get your feedback. And uh, like always, I'd say, please do help us spread the word further by going to our website, hinduacademy.com, and then look at the resources available for you. And it'll make us very happy if I can get to that 10,000 members on our uh, Hinduism course. Thank you all. Have a great week and we will see you next week on Saturday.